Welcome everybody to the, the first session this morning. In uh, this session this morning, we are going to look into the future in, uh, in two different ways. The first talk is about providing network capabilities for today, but also for tomorrow's needs of researchers. And in the second talk, a researcher will talk about his research. And his research is also looking into the future. So I'm now welcoming Bill Johnson from ESNet, and he's a senior scientist and advisor to the US Department of Energy's network, ESNet. He has a background in mathematics and physics. Bill was leading the efforts to enable ESNet to cope with the massive data flows from CERN to ESNet, well, for storage, for processing, and for analysis. He will discuss how ESNet, uh, um, he will discuss ESNet's approach to, um, to support the work of high energy physicists to meet their needs today and in the future. Phil, floor is yours. Good morning. So in this talk, I'm going to do four things, hopefully. I'll tell you just a little bit about ESNet. You can go look at the slides or details at the end if you're interested. I want to tell you uh, about how we determine the requirements for the network, how we respond to those requirements, and then look into the future to see uh, whether or not we have, in fact, uh, satisfied all of the requirements. First of all, uh, ESNet is a, uh, from a European point of view, a bit of a strange beast because it looks a bit like a cross between an infrastructure like Giant and, and one of the NRAMs. So we have a, a national infrastructure, but it, it connects a collection of sites uh, directly to the infrastructure. And the, uh, it's primarily designed for the uh, Department of Energy's Office of Science. The Office of Science and the National Science Foundation in the U.S. together support uh, essentially all scientific research. And the, uh, the Department of Energy, their Office of Science focuses on the large instruments, historically the accelerators, but now other, other large instruments as well. So our approach uh, to determining the requirements of science uh, are essentially threefold. Uh, we look at the uh, network implications of the instruments that are going to be built over the next 10 years. Because some of these are big enough that that's, that's as much, you know, we, we need that kind of lead time. Uh, the second thing uh, is, is and, and how the process of science is evolving. That's, that's also very interesting. It's, it's changed radically in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, and then we develop approaches to build networks that, that will satisfy that. So what is ESNet, very briefly? You know, it, ESNet has all the same services that a typical NRAN does. Uh, IP, V4, V6. Uh, we support uh, collaboration with uh, certification authorities. Uh, and we manage the address space. Uh, ESNet is, is one of the original ISPs. So we provide ISP service to the lab, but we don't buy transit from any, any big customers because we tier with all, all of the networks because we historically um, were there when, the, when those networks were set up. <clears throat> this is what the infrastructure looks like in overview. Uh, the uh, small dots are the end sites that are connected to us. Uh, the transport infrastructure is twofold. Uh, that is, there's two sets of, of routing equipment. I'll explain why uh, a bit later. Um, and the, these are all 10 gigabit links, except that the blue one is multiple 10 gigabit links, which I haven't bothered to expand. Now, the other thing you'll see is that uh, ESNet is, is very richly connected, in particular, to the, uh, the rest of the world's uh, uh, research and education networks. Uh, in addition to the, the private lines to, to, to CERN, which are managed by an entity called the uh, LHCNet that we, we connect to directly. Uh, much of the traffic, much of the data that's generated at the DOE labs goes out 
into the science community to be analyzed. And so what this picture, if, if we look at the top 85% of all ESnet traffic, and we're handling about between three and four petabytes a month uh, currently. Um, there's, you know, 85 to 90% of that goes to 100 sites. And those 100 sites are, are the major uh, research institutions in the U.S. and Europe, plus one in Japan for the nuclear physics uh, folks. And so this is where all that data goes, and this explains the requirement for very rich connectivity in our, in our infrastructure. So the planning process is uh, effectively twofold. Uh, no surprise. We, we look at the current trends in the network to see what's, what's happening. <clears throat> we have a 20, 25 year history of, of traffic in the network. And then we explore the plans of the major stakeholders. And as I said, you know, the data characteristics of, of the simulations and the instruments and then how they're changing what they do with science. So the, the basic observation is this almost perfectly uh, exponential growth starting in, in about 1990 uh, of the traffic. Uh, we increased roughly a factor of 10 uh, every every uh, bit less than four years, and that has been the case you know, for the last uh, 20 years. So that's, that's a data point. One of the things you might observe is that the, the smoothness of the line is getting very choppy up there as, as we uh, as we get toward the uh, the present, and the reason for that is is this: there's several things to observe here. Uh, one is that starting about mid 2004, the red tops there are sort of the top 100 flows in the network, and I don't mean slow in the TCP sense, but say between between two fixed uh, sets of clusters, like in in two physics departments, uh, and you'll see that that has gone from sort of an immeasurable part of the statistical the IP traffic to starting to dominate uh, by 2006 the, the network traffic. The other thing you see is that as the massive data flows generated by the science community start to dominate the traffic, the nature of the traffic is much less statistical. In fact, what I've done here is, is I've shown uh, a uh, nine month or six month period out of the outbound traffic from Fermi Lab. So Fermi Lab is the U.S. Uh, LHC CMS Tier 1 site. And this, and you'll see that the, the traffic profile coming out of Fermi Lab, in fact, is, is driving the traffic profile for the entire network. So you can see that I've, I've lined up the, the peaks there. The other thing that we do is if, if, if we look at these, these flows in time and try and figure out what are the characteristics. What we're seeing, and this is hardly any surprise, is these large science instruments, they, ge they generate very circuit-like flows. That is, uh, there will be a fixed A point, a fixed Z point, and those flows will continue for days, weeks, months, uh, very, very unlike uh, traditional uh, IP traffic. And so, if we summarize the, the requirements that we, that we get from observing the traffic flows, uh, first of all, we have to have an architecture that easily scales because, for obvious reasons, it's exponential growth in the traffic. Most ESnet traffic has a source or sink outside of ESnet. I mean, it's only about 6 or 7% of our traffic actually flows between the big laboratories at, at the ESnet sites. And, and the third point is, uh, the, the science traffic is dominating everything at, at this point, uh, to the level of probably 95% uh, at, at, at this point in, in, uh, in time. So, look, how do we uh, explore the plans of the major stakeholders? Uh, this is a list of our, of our primary connected sites. These are all of the major uh, uh, physical science laboratories in the U.S. And uh, their programs are divided into these sort of six categories. It's primarily physical sciences plus genomics. And all of the physical sciences are, are, are covered from climate materials, uh, energy physics, nuclear physics, and, and so on. And so uh, once, once, uh, once every roughly two and a half years, 
we have a three-day in-depth workshop with the representatives from these uh, areas. That means we're doing two or three of these workshops a year in which we we uh, talk with them to find out what their future plans are, what kind of instruments they're bringing online, what kind of big supercomputer simulations they're working on, what's the time scale, uh, what kind of, what, what, how much data do these things generate, where are their collaborators that are going to analyze the data, and so on. And so we can, we can build these summary tables. And the only thing to note here is these are sort of specific programs and facilities. And uh, this was a summary that was done roughly 2006. And the thing to, to look at is the, the required uh, five year in the future end to end bandwidth. And these are pretty much the uh, steady state bandwidth numbers. Uh, they're not, not very bursty for the most part. And if you just scan down this, and then the bottom we get to high energy physics, you know, if you get to the bottom and you sum these things, it's, it's looking like the science community is saying, we're going to generate an aggregate of, of roughly uh, 800 gigabits a second of data by about 2010. Well, you can't design a network based on this because these are aggregate numbers across the entire network. So the next thing you do is, for those people who understand exactly where their collaborators are, you start mapping those specific numbers uh, onto the network in terms of the the uh, link loading that's going to be uh, generated, in this case, just by three, but the three big users. This does not include climate. We didn't have any information on the climate community at that point. So we've got uh, the LHC, the Relativistic Heavy Ion uh, Collider at, at Brookhaven, and the Supercomputer Centers. And so you see already across the north here, we're talking about essentially filling uh, four or five 10 gigabit lambdas. Uh, and by filling, I mean essentially steady state uh, operation. But these numbers are just estimates. The question is, are they realistic? Well, the answer is yes. I mean, if you look at the, this is the outbound traffic from Fermi Lab for, lab for a period in which they were doing uh, full-scale tests of the analysis software and data handling uh, for the LHC. And this is for a period of four months, and you can see that the average traffic they were generating 24 hours a day uh, was four gigabits a second. So that's, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, network traffic. However, is this the whole story? No, it's not, and I'll, uh, that's the punchline at the end. So what did, what did the ESNet do? Well, we went from a very traditional, we had a packet over Sonnet mixed 10 gigabit, 2.5 gigabit ring around the country, and, the, and all the sites were connected on tail circuits. In uh, 2006 7, <coughs> basically in response to these, these workshops, we designed and built, and because we had the science communities telling DOE what they needed rather than us saying we need to build a bigger network, science communities told DOE, we have to have a bigger network in order to do our science, um, the funding to build the new network was, was forthcoming. So the new network is over here. It's a collection of six sort of interconnected rings, uh, two different core networks. And originally, one was the intent was that the IT traffic would remain on a single 10 gigabit core, and the other traffic <clears throat> that looks like circuit traffic would be shunted off onto a, uh, a uh, circuit switch uh, network, a layer two network. All of the big sites are now connect, dually connected in metropolitan or regional area fiber rings. Um, and every one of our hubs, and our hubs are all located at commercial telecom facilities uh, rather than at end sites, uh, have routing and switching infrastructure for both networks. And all of the large sites, the red, the, uh, uh, diamond, the red diamonds there, are effectively directly connected to our core um, uh, network. And, and that's it. I mean, that's that's the architecture of the of the, uh, the network. And this is pretty well built at this point. Uh, and we have plans and contracts in place to grow this network to essentially uh, six. Six lambdas on the on the um, on the primary uh, ring uh, by uh, about 2011, 
And sometime at the point 2011-12, we start we anticipate 100 gigabit penetration to a certain extent, uh, and so uh, I'm anticipating that we'll go from sort of a 50 or 60 gigabit per second network up to a couple hundred. Uh, we'll say more about that uh, in a moment. So that this was the first response to the requirements was this new architecture and an approach to doing the network. The second response was um, uh, to put together a virtual circuit management uh, uh, service that could be used, and, and, and I use the term service here, not only in the network sense, but in the software sense. So, uh, the thing that we heard loud and clear from the science community was that they wanted to see they wanted to be able to treat network bandwidth as a service in the sense that they could plug it into a service-oriented architecture and uh, have the same sorts of characteristics, predictable characteristics that they could get with re reserving CPU time or disk bandwidth or disk capacity or whatever. So that was the first thing that we, that we uh, heard. The second thing was, what approach should we take to providing a virtual circuit service? And um, unlike a lot of folks who have implemented this, we decided that uh, because of the flexibility and traffic engineering that we wanted to have, we wanted to have symmetry between the, the virtual circuit network and the IP network. Um, and so what we did was we took the approach of using uh, MTLS you know, RSVP, uh, PE, and MTLS to essentially manage the circuit infrastructure. Um, and so the, the virtual circuit infrastructure now operates symmetrically within the SNET, within our IP and SCN cores. So it turns out there is no difference. I mean, one of them is, is a core which is dedicated to virtual circuit service, but only in the sense of traffic engineering. There's nothing else that distinguishes both the circuit service can fail over to the IT core and the IT core can fail over to the circuit uh, service core uh, transparently. Um, and, and that's turned out to be a very useful thing. The services provided are, are, are guaranteed bandwidth res with resiliency, which is to say that, that people can set up multiple paths with explicitly engineered paths that, uh, that replicate some part of the infrastructure that they're worried about failing. Uh, they can't request, they, uh, when they request a bandwidth allocation, they request a certain allocation, but they can set up multiple circuits, and so uh, they can either use one circuit at full capacity and the other one as a backup, or in fact they can load balance across the two circuits, We've, or across the multiple circuits. We've seen all of this done, uh, and the reason it's done is, is, is both uh, um, Fermi and, and, and Brookhaven have Lambda have devices at their borders, uh, software devices called Lambda Station and TerraPaths, and they essentially aggregate flows and manage the internal flows, and, and, and that's the circuit interface, and then they manage the traffic across the circuit. Traffic isolation. MPLS provides for traffic isolation. Uh, if, if, if TCP is not a suitable transcontinental transport, uh, you can use rate-based UDP protocols, and nobody cares because you don't you don't see the nobody else sees those uh, packets in an interfering way. And then, of course, the the SNET engineers use this facility for doing internal traffic engineering uh, in the network. Uh, the connections are secure in the in the sense that endpoints are authenticated in a, in a strong way before they're set up, and as long as the routing control plane in the network maintains its integrity, it's not possible to get into uh, or out of those circuits. In fact, to the extent that we're, that the problem we're wrestling with now is how do we monitor the circuits to know that in fact they're working end to end, and at the moment we don't have a solution for that. Uh, unfortunately, we have to wait for the sites, you know, the end users to tell us that the, the path is broken somewhere. That's one of the sort of the top of the list. And then, of course, you have <coughs> To be useful, these things have to be cross-domain. Um, and that leads to, to uh, because essentially, as I point out, all of our traffic leaves ESNet. 
Uh, and, and first order, it all transits uh, sort of five networks from, from source to sink. And in almost every case, those networks are, uh, you know, the local network, ESNet, uh, one of the big RNE transit networks, uh, Jiant or, or, or uh, Internet2 or National Lambda Rail in the U.S. It goes into an NREN or a regional network in the U.S. and then to the, to the end site. So unless you have a circuit that's set up end to end, this is not a very useful, this whole circuit idea is not very useful. And so a, 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 a group essentially involving these, these people, that is CSNet, uh, Dante, uh, Internet 2, some of the NRANs, uh, for, story, uh, for reasons that aren't worth going into, Caltech is in there, they run USLHCNet, and a, an interdomain control protocol has been defined. That is a way for the circuit controllers in each of the domains to talk to each other in order to set up an end-to-end -end circuit. And that's actually uh, working working fairly well now. Uh, we still have holes, but you know we we can set up circuits to uh, a couple of different uh, U uh, U.S. regionals and and uh, European universities. Uh, for those of you who like architecture, the whole the whole architecture of of Oscars, which is the ESnet uh, domain controller is modularized in, in, uh, in, in sort of a, a web services architecture. Uh, the core of it is, is reservation management, path computation. The path computation uh, 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 piece is actually being pulled out now, and, and they're, the, the DICE folks are working on a certain level of standardization within path computation. Uh, this is, the scheduling is very interesting, because what you have to do to schedule is you have to make you have to take a, a look at the topology of your network. And the topology of the network uh, has, has, has link loadings that correspond to the other reservations. And then you have to find a path through that topology which will provide for the requested uh, a service. And then you have to do that for as far into the future as the service uh, is going to live, which is, which is typically months. So you have to have a temporal topology database that looks at, that represents the network not only today but as far into the future as your as your longest reservation uh, extends. So that's you know it's taken people a while to sort that all out, but in fact it does work nicely now. And then there's the the uh, uh, where to go? There's the uh, IDC inner inner domain controller mechanism. Uh, each each domain is essentially how much information about the domain is exported to the neighboring IDC is a policy issue. At the very least, of course, you have to export information about where is the ingress and egress points that you can that you can connect to in terms of services. I won't, there's, there's a lot to be said about this, but I won't uh, don't have time to go into it now. This is a production service in ESN. Uh, one of the things we found out early on was that people had difficulty keeping track of what circuits they had set up and where they were going. And so, uh, uh, Vangelis, uh, Shaniotakis, who, who is a young Greek fellow who, in, in our engineering group, put together this tool. This, this tool is an automated map tool. They generate these maps one, once a day uh, for each of the major sites. And then they're sent to the sites, and this shows all of the virtual circuits that have been set up for that site. And so I, they're illegible, so I've labeled them. You know, it shows you know, all the uh, Tier 2 uh, LHC uh, virtual circuits between Fermi and, Argonne, uh, Fermi and Brookhaven and the U.S. universities, uh, the OPN circuits. I say VLANs here because, you know, what, what the controller does is most of the very high bandwidth circuits are requested as a layer two circuit, and uh, the VLAN tag is just negotiated, but that VLAN tag is always local. And so as, as we go across our infrastructure and set this up, uh, the VLANs span no more than the uh, ingress-egress ports on every one of these switches. So there's no problem of globally managing VLAN tags across our entire network. 
And this, of course, is something that's done fairly easily with, with MPLS. Um, and we use the same infrastructure to manage all of our internal VLANs for the, for the uh, network configuration. Uh, this has been a, a great uh, time saver. All right, so the third thing that we heard, and there's nothing surprising about this, was as, as these, these big applications demand a service, you know, an integral part of what a service is, is an ability to get feedback on what the service is doing. And so there's been a group, group who've been putting together uh, uh, the, the uh, various implementations of, of Personar and using Personar to provide for end-to-end uh, -end monitoring of the circuits. And in fact, in the international community, <coughs> uh, the network operators are starting to use this sort of facility because it provides them with an end-to-end -end view. And so the way Personar works, uh, provides end-to-end -end data, is that each, each network domain uh, exports whatever measurements it wants. And th these are becoming more and more comprehensive as, as the operators become comfortable with this idea. The measurements are exported, uh, put into a standardized format, which is really how Personar started in the, in the Global Grid Forum as a standard network object format. Uh, these are pushed into measurement archives, and then you can write applications. So one of the applications that has been written is this uh, trace route visualizer. So what you do is you, you run a trace route from your, 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 your local environment to where you're trying to get, hand it to trace route visualizer, and then it, it walks the uh, <clears throat> the measurement archives of all of the intermediate nodes and presents you with these these graphs that show the uh, note of the uh, uh, link capacity and current loading state all the way from in this case my my office machine at, at Berkeley oops, to <laughs> in this case uh, a uh, uh, a web server in in in, in Italy. The things that are missing in the middle, um, where I say no data, is because that segment of the network didn't have data exported into a uh, into a, uh, a measurement archive. This this is sort of a nuisance to make this kind of a picture. So I haven't updated it. When I did this, uh, Gar was one of the the networks that had done a good job of deploying the the measurement archives, and so I could get a, a meaningful. You know, most of the stuff in the middle now is is is, is John, and that's all been filled out uh, in the me meantime. <coughs> Very valuable, and the more the more archives that are deployed, the more valuable this gets. And so this is why the the network operators are becoming more and more interested because they can they can monitor things that they know are important major science data paths. <coughs> so what does the situation look like now? Uh, in the OSNET. The current status for right now is essentially we, we, we have the infrastructure in place and the plans in place to adequately cover everything that we know about for the next couple of years, which is uh, essentially the LHC, the supercomputer traffic, and uh, the, uh, the climate simulation traffic. Um, The new network was designed in roughly 2006, which is before we did a lot of these formal workshops. We did some informal workshops. Um, but, you know, that's, in fact, we haven't gotten any surprises. And, and the formal workshops that we've done uh, up to this point have sort of have, have reaffirmed uh, the strategy that we developed in, in 2006. However, as I point out, this is not the whole story. Uh, there's increasing evidence that several of the science, big science communities have substantially underestimated the amount of, of, of traffic that they're going to be generating. And the, you know, the perfect storm example of this was that in the U.S. there's the LHC, you know, there's the uh, Tier 0 at CERN, the Tier 1 data centers. They don't do analysis there. That's just a data pre-processing and archive center. The Tier 2 centers, we knew about. These are the major universities where most of the data analysis is done. And then in, in the U.S., I don't think this is true of Europe, there was something called the Tier 3 centers. And these are intended to be the smaller universities that 
didn't meet the requirements of a Tier 2 data center. And two years ago, everybody dismissed these as, you're not going to see any significant traffic. Plan for a gigabit per second at most to these centers, and, and you'll be covered. I, I will say that Harvey Newman, a colleague, uh, turn colleague at Caltech, told me that this is utter nonsense, and he was right. You know, half of the tier three centers today have 10 gigabit connections into the major exchange points and are using them actively. Okay? So it's, it's entirely possible that the installed base of the analysis hardware being used on the LHC data um, will, will generate, will consume several times the, the, the traffic that they originally uh, predicted. We've also gotten hints from the climate community that this is going to happen. So, how do, how do you predict the future, uh, but not trying to just use our historical data as a projector? And so, what do we know? And what we know is, um, we can look at, we, we know the traffic growth patterns, but we can also look at the history of the size of the data sets that various science disciplines uh, generate. Because historically, <coughs> these data set sizes have been a good predictor of the amount of network traffic that they generate. And so what I did was I went to uh, three different communities where I happened to know, know people, and I asked, uh, look, what, what historically has been your data set sizes, and where do you see those going? And you know, the, the easy one was, was uh, hydrogen physics, um, because I know the hydrogen physics community well. I talked to uh, to Harvey and to Richard Mont, a uh, physicist at, at Slack, both of whom have been involved in, in accelerator physics since the, since the 70s. And I said, uh, tell me what each major experiment has generated in terms of data set size. So then I, I just do a you know, log linear plot of, of time versus. These are different quantities. I've just normalized them. So don't, there's no significance to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, scale there, other than the fact that it's exponential. So similarly, uh, so then I looked at, well, we have a good good track record for ESNet traffic, so I just plot that same thing on there that, that we saw before. Um, and then I went to the climate community and asked uh, our, our colleagues, uh, we have a, a significant climate group at, at Berkeley and another one at Livermore, I know both of them, said, you know, look, What's going to happen with the climate data, and and this is driven by something called the IPCC, the this international uh, simulation community that generates a report every five or seven years, and so they told me where the data set sizes, and these are these are simulated, this, these are output from computer simulations uh, over the next you know roughly out to 2012, because they know that because they already have the requirements for what the report has to, to talk about, thought of that, um, and then I thought somewhere in here I put the supercomputer data, but I guess not. So, <clears throat> and then the final thing I did was, you know, we have a roadmap, a capacity roadmap that has to do with how fast we're going to be deploying waves, which as much as anything is a budget roadmap, because that's, that's what governs how quickly we can uh, uh, um, deploy waves, and you put these all in this log linear plot, and it scares me. And the reason it scares me is because uh, it doesn't matter what the units here are, the, the, real, the real data set sizes that generate corresponding traffic are growing exponentially faster than our both current network usage, but more importantly, our capacity roadmap. So at some point, these, this, this use of the network is going to overwhelm our, our planned uh, capacity. Uh, yeah. and so, so my guess is, looking at the growth and the actual bandwidth usage of these communities, that we're going to be in some difficulties by 2015. That's when we'll outgrow our current growth pattern. And so what's the path forward? We have to do something. It seems pretty clear that there are two things that we can do to the network. Uh, the first is we're going to have to have capacity well beyond our current uh, projections. The second thing is that we, we need 
of our flexibility. Right now, all this topological uh, richness that we have in the network is primarily used for redundancy and backup. Uh, we really would like the ability to uh, to uh, do, do automated traffic engineering so we can we can spread our traffic across this topology better than we can today. And, and, and I'm talking about the, the layer zero one topology. As we would like to be able to shift uh, where the waves are connected uh, in the underlying uh, transport uh, system. That means that we want to, in, you know, we, we've got the routing effectively at layer three. We do it at layer two and a half for, for setting up the circuits. We want to push this down and incorporate dynamic routing into, into uh, layer one as well, because then we can better make use of the available uh, light paths uh, across the, uh, the network. Um, and so that's what I've just said. And so we, we, we have a, we're in the process right now of putting together a test bed. Uh, our underlying transport, uh, ESNet and Internet 2, share a, a dedicated way, uh, a cyber service uh, on that footprint I showed you. And the uh, transport here, the DWDM equipment, uh, is, uh, is from uh, Infinera. And Infinera has an internal switch that allows you to do uh, complete input port, output port uh, mapping. Uh, under uh, control of, a, of an external protocol. It turns out that Infinera also can set up uh, essentially a layer one VPN, that is you can stack these boxes one on top of the other and, and uh, route the output of, of one of these boxes, which is a switch assembly, uh, through one of the waves of the other one. So we've set up a, that, that gives us the ability to set up a test bed in which we're using waves in the underlying production network effectively as fiber paths. And then above that, uh, we, we have a collection of 10 gigabit interfaces and a switch in a box that we can control without, uh, experimentally without worrying about disrupting the underlying network. It's, 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 just, a, it's just a trick. I mean, it, it allows us to build a test bed which is of significant scale but without, you know, testing our, our ideas on, on, the, uh, on the production transport equipment. So that test bit is in the process of, of being built. What about 100 gigabit waves? Um, we can't, my, the reason I say I think that we're going to have difficulties in 2015 is we don't, we can't acquire enough 10 gigabit waves, uh, either financially or in terms of the transport that we're currently using to meet the capacity. So we're going to have to go to 100 gigabit waves. And uh, quite amazingly, uh, <clears throat> we have received you know, a pile of money uh, from the, the, uh, the federal government's uh, economic stimulus package, something we never dreamed uh, would happen, but to build a 100 gigabit test bed uh, essentially across the country. And for those of you who listened to Steve Cotter's talk yesterday, uh, he, or, or you can look at it, on the Toronto website, uh, he describes what the test bed is, is, is going to look like. And so, it, it, it's rather impractical at the moment. <clears throat> you know, the interfaces tend to cost not much different than 10 times, you know, what a <clears throat> 10 gigabit interface costs. Um, the transport, you know, the ways the, trans the DWDM systems are dealing with this are very all over the map. But that's fine. I mean, if, if once we start generating a market for this, uh, the situation will stabilize, and, and the first people into the market, which is to say the test bed, are going to pay through the nose for uh, for equipment that in, in several years will be either obsolete or the cost will be 20% of what it is now or both. And so that's fine. I mean, the whole point of the rationale for DOE using some of this this money was to the stimulus money was, in fact, to drive this market toward the, the next generation of, of transport system. So, in conclusion, uh, you know, the U.S. and the, uh, the European networks and the regionals, are, we're, I think we're in reasonably good shape for the next two to three years in terms of meeting the science uh, capacity requirements. Um, the current infrastructure uh, cannot be scaled linearly, I believe, to meet the requirements 
say in 2015. And so we're going to have to come up with uh, probably a multiplicity of new approaches involving dynamic management of the waves um, on, onto the fibers, uh, the 100 gig transport. Uh, one of the things that we want to do is to take this, this uh, uh, the uh, uh, virtual circuit management system and make it completely dynamic, which is to say that we can take a, a circuit which is currently loaded in use and move it from one place, of the, uh, from one place in the transport uh, infrastructure to another place, transparently to the end user. Um, it's also the case that not all of the science community is going to be making immediate use of the circuit services. They're still going to be generating large IT flows. So the other thing we want to be able to do is to take, identify these, these flows and move them automatically off of the IT network onto the virtual circuit network. And uh, now that, you know, and, and we finally have the hardware in hand that makes that possible, and that's these, you know, uh, most of our network equipment is, is universe of one sort or another. Well, they now have these processor modules that will do packet inspection at line rate. So we can use these to generate statistics and then change the routing on a per flow basis by using this processor module to identify what's going on. For those of you who have a long memory, uh, when Tom Lyon uh, uh, set up the Ypsilon network system, he was using tagged IT flows within an ATM network in exactly the same way. Uh, and, and in fact, it was his work in that network that led to MTLS as, as, a, as a service. Uh, he was the one that implemented the early ideas. And then, of course, you know, beyond 20, 2015 to 2017, my crystal ball will get foggy. I don't know what we're going to see. Uh, it could be that what we see is the next generation of fiber. Uh, we could see large-scale deployments of these so-called vacuum core fibers. Uh, which might result in, you know, the dispersion going down to the point where the wave counts on the transport equipment will go up exponentially, you know, from a few hundred to a few thousand or even a few tens of thousands. This is just a wild guess, but that's, that's one possible path uh, ten years forward uh, from now. But I think it will rely on, on new fiber being uh, installed, which in the U.S., of course, is no trivial issue. I, I left out the map. Actually, I'm going to show it. So, we ESNet operates. We have an engineering staff of seven, operations staff of eight, roughly eight people, deployment staff of five or six, and we design, build, and operate this whole network. Well, the challenge is, in no small part, geographic. You know, if you put San Francisco at the northern tip of Norway then Boston sits roughly in downtown Cairo. So that's the geographic extent of the network. And so that's a challenge for a small group of people to, uh, to, uh, to operate. Uh, that, that's a picture I'd like to put up on talking to European audiences. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you very much, Bill. <coughs> there is time for one or two questions. I've seen one hand going up there. Can you pass the microphone? Please. Okay, if you right, go to talk, I'll repeat them. Um, in one of your earlier slides, uh, you uh, uh, said uh, that you had a symmetrical behavior between your circuits and your IP. So what you said is if the circuit fail, they switch uh, the traffic over to the internet, to the IP network. We have seen that in earlier days, uh, we used the UDP protocol on the circuit, so it will immediately knock out the destination on your IP network. If you remember in the beginning of uh, the LEC OPN, when we were experimenting and testing it, we had a failure on one of the circuits to, to uh, Chicago, we are still using public address space. And all the traffic went to the front door of, uh, of Family Lab and we knocked out Family Lab. Motivated by one of your talks to say, you know, push, push, push down the flows to the appropriate level uh, so you can reduce the cost of the equipment. 
and that was in fact our idea. Um, but the equipment has changed so much that that's not quite as valid an argument anymore. And we've never expected to have a, a full IP routing infrastructure in the virtual circuit network. But in point of fact, that's exactly what we have because the cost is, is not significantly greater than 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 just uh, uh, switches. Um, I'm not quite sure I caught the question about Fermilab. Uh, the other thing that we've seen is that Fermilab and, and Brookhaven, I mean, Fermilab, even at this point in time, uh, has almost 100 gigabits from the lab to the two major exchange points in Chicago. Now, that's pointless from our backbone point of view, because we only have 30 or 40 gigabits in the backbone, but they, they, we fan out that traffic at starlight into all the tier, you know, all the tiering points for the tier twos, uh, the LHC um, uh, paths, uh, and and so on. Uh, so I'm not. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, on circuits, you typically use UDP protocols, and they don't care about uh, the receiving end. So if you switch over circuit traffic to the IP network, you knock out uh, the destination. So the, the question was. Uh, uh, how can we use uh, impolite protocols in the in the IP network? And uh, the answer is that uh, impolite protocols, that is UDP-based protocols, are are only an issue in a, in a TCP network uh, if there's congestion, because you don't want them. You don't. You want to be able to do uh, fair queuing and, and dropping and, and so on. And the IP, the UDP pro uh, protocols don't uh, adhere to that by using the the way we provide bandwidth guarantees in the circuit infrastructure is uh, when you request a reservation, you request a fixed amount of bandwidth. Uh, and, and we only allow bandwidth re requests up to the capacity of the network. And we have a certain fraction of our IT network that we've, that we've allocated that is comfortably above the headroom. And, and then we rate limit the, on the ingress point. And so, uh, a reservation for 100 gigabits, I mean 100 megabits or 500 megabits, is only allowed 500 megabits. That's not quite true. I mean, it's not a hard, you know, there's a certain amount of bursting that's allowed. And so that can go into the IP network in a non-interfering way, even if it's like the UDP traffic. Okay, let's thank, thank Phil again. <laughs> So let me welcome the next speaker, it's uh, Stefan Ramsdorf, he's with the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and he works there as an oceanographer. Earlier employment included the New Zealand Oceanographic Institute and the Institute of Marine Science in Kiel. Welcome. So, and he's also um, a lead author of the uh, well-known false assessment of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we will get up the latest update of research in this field. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It was a little hard to get here. And thanks to, to you for keeping our science in business by keeping the data flowing. I have a tough task to get you up to speed on climate science in about 30 or 40 minutes, so I'll get right to it and I start with a very simple but fundamental point and that is that the global temperature is a result of a simple energy balance. The energy that drives the climate system comes from the sun. About a third of that is reflected back into space by the bright surfaces on the Earth, that's the clouds, and ice and snow covered areas, and the Earth, like any physical body, also radiates uh, long wave radiation out into space. And there you already have the heat budget equation which determines the global temperature. And that's very simple because there are not many ways how you can get heat into our planet or out of the planet again. So, Global temperature is a very simple 
parameter that we can calculate with great confidence and there are only a few ways to change it. One of those ways, and I want to look back at the past here for a bit because paleoclimate is my main field of research. So one of those ways of changing the radiation budget is by changing the orbit of the Earth and that, as hopefully all of you know, is the cause of the ice ages that has been known since the uh, 1920s or 1930s and certainly was school material when I went to high school. I show this uh, here because that's, by the way, the last 400,000 years of climate. I show this for two reasons. One, to put the recent development of the CO2 concentration into a longer term context. In blue curve you see carbon dioxide from the Antarctic ice core data showing that it has varied <coughs> in a range between 190 and 290 parts per million over the past 400,000 years and actually as we now know from the latest ice cores also of the past 800,000 years at least. And I think that puts into context what we uh, have recently measured as an increase in the atmosphere. The second reason why I show this is because it's a nice example of how we work, how we test our climate models on climate of the past. And here is a, a model simulation performed in my group of the last 200,000 years of climate, uh, a climate model driven by these orbital cycles and the CO2 concentration that we get from the ice core data. And you can see the, the ice sheets growing and shrinking here predominantly in the rhythm of these orbital cycles. And of course we compare this with all the, the geologic data that we have about the actual extent of the ice sheets at certain times in the Earth's history. Well, now at this stage we're moving into uh, the last, or into, towards the maximum of the last ice age that was about 20,000 years ago. Time is running on the bottom right on this film here. And so now we see the ice sheet vanishing at the end of the last ice age, moving into the Holocene. Let's zoom in to the closer past, that's the last 10,000 years, and there you can see very clearly this uh, remarkable increase in carbon dioxide in the air, which we know for certain that this, is, this increase in the last 150 years or so is 100% human-caused. We know this from isotope analysis, but we also know it simply if you make up the budget, because that increase that we measure in the atmosphere is actually only half of the carbon dioxide that we have put into the atmosphere through our smokestacks and car exhausts, etc., from the fossil fuels. We know that because we simply know how much coal, oil, and gas has been dug up from the Earth's crust and how much carbon was contained in that. So there can be no question that some of that CO2 rise might have some natural origin in the Earth system. The exact opposite is the case. The natural Earth system has taken up about half of the extra carbon dioxide that we have put into the atmosphere. So how did it do it? Where is this missing CO2 gone that's not in the atmosphere anymore? Well, most of it has been taken up by the ocean where carbon dioxide dissolves in the seawater at the sea surface and forms carbonic acid. Now, in, in one sense, that's very good because if the ocean didn't take up so much of our carbon, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere would rise even much faster and we'd have even less time solving the climate problem. On the other hand, it's, uh, for me, especially as an ocean scientist, uh, it's very bad news because carbonic acid is making the oceans more acidic, also a measured trend. And this is a major threat to marine ecosystems because many marine organisms live by forming calcium carbonate shells, the normal seashells that you find on the beach. Coral reefs are made of that stuff as well. But even more importantly, this microplankton that you see on the microscopic images on the right there, which form the foundation of many of the food webs in the ocean. So in my view, this problem alone, the ocean acidification problem, which is very simple chemistry, would be enough reason to drastically reduce our CO2 emissions, even if CO2 did not cause any climate change. But we know it is causing climate change. That's not a terribly new uh, result. It was in the, in the mid-19th century, actually, that John Tyndall demonstrated this in measurements. 
the same year that uh, Darwin published his Origin of Species. And uh, in the late 19th century, the Swedish Nobel laureate uh, Quanta Arrhenius uh, demonstrated for the first time, or quantified that effect for the first time, in calculating how much global warming would you get if you doubled the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. He got a value of 4 to 6 degrees global warming. That number is called the climate sensitivity, uh, now perhaps the most important parameter of the climate system, because it tells us how much warming do you get for a given increase in CO2, so how sensitive is the climate system to carbon dioxide. And there are many ways to determine this, including from those paleoclimatic data, that's the specialty of uh, my research group, but all these uh, different estimations always come back to the same basic result, namely that climate sensitivity to a CO2 doubling is about 3 degrees, with the remaining uncertainty of about plus minus 1 degree. Now, if that's the case, you can easily calculate how much warming we should have caused until today, and from the change in the atmospheric composition that we have caused until today, and that warming is between 0.7 and 0.9 degrees centigrade. So that's basically the forecast of physics, how much warming we should have caused. If you compare that to the observed warming, you find a very similar number. We have seen a warming of about 0.8 degrees since 1900. Um, the agreement between the anthropogenic effect and the observed is already a pointer to the fact that the natural variations of volcanic eruptions, solar activity, have played only a very small role over this particular time period here. Notably, solar activity has gone down, as uh, many of you might have uh, read about, over the last uh, 30 years or so. It's now, the last couple of years, has been at its absolute lowest since the beginning of the satellite measurements in the 1970s. But this decline in the brightness of the sun is so small, it's about an, an order of magnitude smaller in its radiative effect than the greenhouse gases, so that it has not noticeably slow down the global warming. You can see here the annual values, by the way, and the long-term trend. Of course, there is always natural variability in the climate system superimposed on the long-term trend. So you all get some years that are colder, uh, like the last year, 2008, or some years uh, that are warmer uh, than the average, uh, for example, 2007 or 2005. Now, if we didn't have those temperature data that come from weather stations all over the world, we would still see there is a warming. For example, you can see it from space, so in case aliens are watching us from somewhere out there in space, they know what's going on. They just have to look at the sea ice cover of our planet in the Arctic. This is uh, shown here for 1979, the first year we had those satellite images. That's 2007. And, uh, if you compare this, you can see that the Arctic sea ice cover has shrunk by about half over this time period. And that's the time series to go with it, the red line. You see the steady decline, again, of course, superimposed by interannual variations. And you can also see that this decline is much faster than climate scientists expected. That's the uh, range of models that went into the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that's shown in this blue range here. Uh, that is because some aspects of climate are vastly more complex than calculating just the global mean temperature, which, as I said, is simply a result of a very simple energy budget. Ice is much more complex in its physical behavior, and so we cannot model that nearly as well. And often, uh, us climate scientists are accused in the media that we are overly pessimistic, but unfortunately it turns out that in many cases, the actual observed trends are overtaking our projections, so we have been too optimistic still. Here is the latest reconstruction for global temperatures over the past millennium, and uh, I mostly show this to put this into context of what we expect for the future. So the blue line here in this graph is the same one as, as that uh, previous one here. You can see how those natural variations over the past millennium are dwarfed by uh, the expected warming which uh, will unfold over the next hundred years, the magnitude of which, of course, is dependent mostly on how much we will emit in terms of greenhouse gases. That's why there are different scenarios for low emissions, high emissions. As natural scientists, we, of course, we don't try to predict 
the emissions of humanity, we just try to predict the effect given there would be a certain amount of emissions. And the uncertainty that we still have in, in making a temperature calculation, if we know what the emissions are, is shown by these uncertainty bands in each color uh, around each of these emission scenarios. So we will end up for low emissions somewhere between 2 and 3 degrees global warming for high emissions could be 4 to 7 degrees and 4 to 7 degrees centigrade that's about the difference between the maximum of the last ice age and today. Now those were the global mean temperatures that's rather deceptive in a way because there are big regional variations and this shows the, the highest resolution global climate simulation that we have from Japanese colleagues run on the Earth simulator, which uh, for years was the fastest supercomputer on Earth. The year is running at the bottom left there. Up to the year 2000, you don't see very much but natural variability, but uh, now you see the orange colors start to dominate, so the global trend is uh, getting quite visible everywhere. You can also see some hot spots like the Arctic or the Himalaya. That is due to the ice albedo defect because of snow and ice areas shrinking, you get an amplified warming there because less sunlight is reflected back into space in these areas than it was before. We can also clearly see the difference between land and ocean areas. The air above the oceans remains much cooler, uh, both because of the heat storage effect and because of the evaporation, uh, which takes up a lot of the extra radiation that's coming in. And uh, that is why I said the global mean numbers are a bit deceptive. Here you have a global mean warming of about 4 degrees, so by no means an extreme scenario, but it means that most land areas where we actually live and conduct our agriculture, for example, have warmed by 6 degrees or more, and in the Arctic we see even in excess of 12 degrees warming. So let's talk a little bit about the impacts of that warming. Number one is heat waves. That is obvious even to a lay person that heat waves will increase in severity and frequency in a warmer climate. We had an example of a rather extreme heat wave in Europe here in 2003 that caused at least 35,000 fatalities. And of course, any individual extreme event cannot be put down to a long-term trend. That is just like if you have a loaded dice and that you roll twice as many sixes as a usual dice. If you throw one six, uh, you simply cannot answer whether that particular one was caused by the dice being loaded. It's simply an ill-posed question. So what we can answer scientifically is how the frequency of such extreme events changes with a long-term climate change. And uh, it shows, turns out, for example, that in the 2040s, if we continue our business as usual path, then an extreme summer like this one uh, will be a very normal, will be an average summer. And by the 2060s, there will be hardly uh, ever again such a cool summer as was this extreme heat wave 2003. Another aspect is the changes to the water cycle, precipitation changes. Here I show the observed trend for Europe in the large picture and you can clearly see a, a big drying out of uh, the Mediterranean area over the past uh, 45 years here. And that is exactly what has been predicted by model simulations. It's a very robust uh, prediction across the board of uh, climate models. An example is shown in the right uh, inset panel here that in response to the increase in greenhouse gases, the Mediterranean area will dry out. And one of the consequences of that is increased forest fire risks. We have seen that uh, practically every year, either Portugal, Spain, Italy, or like in August 2007, here these extreme fires in Greece. Similar things apply to other subtropical areas of the world. For example, California, same thing, increasing trend to drought, exactly as predicted by the climate models, increased fire risk. A similar thing happens in Australia, where this year we had this uh, extreme incidence of uh, tragical fires caused by unprecedented temperature records set there after a prolonged period of drought. Another physical consequence of warming is sea level rise. Warm water expands, so sea level rises, and the other factor is that warming causes continental ice to melt so that more water flows into the ocean. Uh, here you see the measurements. 
they show in a sea level rise of 20 centimeters uh, since the 1870s. The blue line is the, the satellite observations that started in 1993. And you can also see that this trend is accelerating. It's slower at first and then it's getting steeper as we progress. And actually there is an extremely close correlation between the speed at which the sea level rises with the global temperature, as I showed in a paper in Science a couple of years ago. This, of course, threatens not only people in low-lying areas like Bangladesh and many other regions, coral islands, uh, but also critical infrastructure. That's why I put this inset here of the sizable denuclear power station in Great Britain, which is, uh, as you can see, very close to the sea, as are many other nuclear power stations that use the sea for cooling water. This rise, again, like the shrinking Arctic uh, sea ice, is faster than we expected in the models. Uh, the IPCC projection for this time period uh, for the satellite era starting in 1993 was uh, 1.9 millimeters per year. What the satellites actually measure is 3.4 millimeters per year, which is about 80% faster than we have projected. So things, unfortunately, are developing worse than we thought, or are they actually much better than we thought? If you read the media, you might be quite confused on this point because you read things like this one here. Over the past two years, sea levels have not increased at all. Actually, they show a slight drop. Should we not be told that this is much better than expected? Not too many people say things like that, but the media love it uh, to print it again and again. This is uh, Björn Lomborg. Uh, he titled that article, I love that, uh, Let the Data Speak for Itself. And he was explicitly referring to this satellite sea level data set, um, but he didn't show it, um, because otherwise his readers would have seen through this. He just picks out this particular period here, and as in any noisy time series, by cherry picking a short section, you can always show any trends that you like. It just has nothing to do with science. The major uh, issue, the big gorilla, so to speak, in the sea level question are the continental ice sheets. Here is a picture of Greenland, and the blue areas show where the surface has been going down, that is where the Greenland ice has been losing mass based on remote sensing data. And not surprisingly, Greenland is uh, shrinking around the edges because that's where it's at the lowest elevation and that's uh, in the warmest air, of course. On Greenland, you can see also uh, things like these meltwater lakes forming here. You can see big meltwater streams and this meltwater vanishes in big holes like that that are called moulins and uh, scientists have shown that this water actually reaches the base of the ice sheet where it uh, lifts up the ice that was frozen to the bed before it acts like a lubricant, it transports heat down there and it makes the ice basically flow faster. Most of the outlet glaciers of Greenland have greatly accelerated in their flow rates in recent years so the ice is draining faster into the ocean and these are all processes that we cannot model with confidence into the future yet. But we know it's a very big risk. Greenland alone has enough ice to raise the global sea level by 7 meters, and Arctica has enough ice to raise global sea level by another 60 meters. So that basically means we can't afford to losing even a few percent of the continental ice that we have on the planet now. And turning again to the Earth's history, we know from the past that the ice has always responded in a big way to temperature changes. I showed you this movie animation of our simulation in the beginning. During the last ice age, sea level was about 120 meters lower than it is now, and temperatures were 4 to 7 degrees colder. That's one point, the lower left point on the diagram here, which shows how sea level has, has responded in the past. If you go back far enough in time, uh, you come to climates, to warmer climates. The last time it was significantly warmer on this planet was in the Pliocene about three million years ago. Temperatures about two to three meters, uh, two to three degrees higher, sea level about 25, 30 meters higher at the time. And if you go back even further to the Eocene 40 million years ago, that was the last time the planet was practically ice free, also due to high CO2 concentrations, by the way. And Temperatures then are estimated only about 4 degrees warmer globally than now, but sea level was 70 meters higher. So you see very big sea level responses in the past uh, of uh, Earth history. And compared to that, the projection, the expectation for the year 2100, 
that's shown here that's less than one meter sea level rise uh, is looking ridiculously small and that is because the time scale of the ice sheet response is longer than a hundred years so by the year 2100 we will only see the smallest beginning of a much much larger sea level problem that will unfold in the centuries to follow virtually unstoppable but caused by us in the next few decades or so. Projections of sea level for the future are very uncertain. I mentioned that already, mostly because we can't model the ice sheet behavior very well. There are some ways of trying to get around this and make estimates. Uh, I want to just point out here the, the longer term component. The Dutch government last year compiled uh, an, uh, a study by 20 sea level experts from around the world to, as a basis for raising its dikes. And uh, this so-called Delta Commission arrived at uh, an estimate for the year 2200 between 1 meter 50 and 3 meter 50 sea level rise. And the German Advisory Council on Global Change that advises their government on these issues, and I'm a mem member of that, put out a report uh, in 2006 uh, daringly estimating sea level rise for the year 2300, arriving at between 2 meters 50 and 5 meters. And that's not for an extreme warming scenario, that's assuming we stop global warming at 3 degrees. So you often hear the numbers for the year 2100, but we should not forget, that's my point here, that it doesn't stop then. We will be causing a much longer term sea level rise that will, if we don't act very fast, go into the meters and therefore drown many of our coastal cities, island nations, and so on. The final risk that I want to discuss is the tropical cyclones. This just shows their climatology, where they occur. And we have seen some rather extreme events. Uh, I don't even mention the extreme Atlantic season that brought us Hurricane Katrina, but even since then, more uh, records have been set. We had the first super typhoon in the Persian Gulf, uh, Category 5, the strongest category uh, tropical storm hit Bangladesh in 2007. And in 2008, we had major fatalities in, in Burma, and the island of Haiti was struck by four hurricanes uh, within a month that uh, was unprecedented. But this, this is just anecdotal, of course, in science, we have to look at the long-term trends. And uh, let's first look at the Atlantic. There are now some pretty good compilations of tropical cyclones going back to 1870, showing uh, firstly, that the number of tropical cyclones in the Atlantic has increased to record levels in uh, the recent uh, decade or two. And that is even if you account for all uh, kinds of assumptions about possible undercount bias in the earlier times when some hurricanes might have been missed because not so many ships were everywhere and certainly we had no satellites then. Uh, even that, then that remains true. And uh, what is also remarkable is how closely this follows sea surface temperatures. That's one of those curves in here, the blue one, uh, which is very tightly correlated in the Atlantic with the number of tropical cyclones. So that's why many scientists fear that with further warming, the number and intensity of tropical storms will increase further. The global picture is uh, slightly more difficult to assess or because we, we don't have such good data outside the Atlantic Basin. But we can look at the satellite era that started in 1980, and the recent study in Nature has shown that uh, the intensity of the strongest storms has uh, been increasing significantly over this uh, period since the beginning of the satellite observations. And one degree warming roughly corresponds to a 30% increase in the number of the strongest tropical storms of category 4 and 5. So, Apart from these extreme events and risks that are discussed, we also have some very uncertain major system risks that are discussed in the scientific community as tipping points or tipping elements. A review paper on that was published last year, one of the most cited climate papers of last year, and it looks at the risk of qualitative and, and irreversible or abrupt changes in the system, like a sudden switch in ocean currents, a dieback of the Amazon forest due to drought, uh, 
changes in the Indian monsoon system which uh, could become chaotic and so on. These are very hard to assess, but we have to mention them because uh, they are, if they were to occur, they are real big things that uh, are like rocks under the water surface. We don't know where they are, how close we are, but we are moving our Earth into uncharted water with this warming and there are some uh, big hidden risks there that we simply cannot predict at this stage, but we know uh, this risk exists and is not negligible. So our final point here is that global warming is largely irreversible. This is a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that uh, appeared this year that demonstrates this quite nicely. Uh, here are some very uh, uh, extreme illustrative assumptions were made about our CO2 emissions, namely these authors simply assume we follow a business as usual path and then one day we decide from one day to the next to cut our emissions to zero. So no more CO2 or other greenhouse gas emissions. So what then happens to the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere shown in the upper panel, you can see various curves corresponding to various points where the emissions are cut to zero. At that point where we cut the emissions, CO2 stops rising and starts falling. That's obvious, but it doesn't fall back to its pre-industrial level. Rather, even after a thousand years, a substantial increase remains because of the long lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere. And if you look at the temperature response of the planet to this, you see that at the time where we cut the emissions to zero, the warming stops, but temperatures don't go down very much either. So they remain elevated for at least a thousand years. So the message here is we can stop global warming, but we cannot reverse it once we have caused it. So there's no way back one day if we decide it's gotten too hot. We can't go back. We can only act uh, proactively according to the precautionary principle if we want to avoid a dangerous interference with the climate system. Now what should we do? More than 100 nations have now adopted the goal of limiting global warming to a maximum of 2 degrees and this will be a major issue at the end of this year in Copenhagen when we have the talks about the Kyoto follow-up uh, global agreement. And the question is thus, um, how can we limit the warming to 2 degrees? Uh, what kind of emissions reductions are required for that? And uh, important new studies have appeared in Nature a few weeks ago that uh, analyzes in great detail, including all the uncertainties that we still have. And the simple bottom line is that it doesn't depend very much on emissions in any particular year. What really counts is the total, the integral of our emissions over the next decade. So uh, we can say that if we want to stay below two degree global warming with a good probability, say 75% probability, then we can still emit 700 gigatons of CO2 until the year 2050. That's the budget that we have available. Now, at the current rate, we will have used this budget within 20 years. If we keep increasing the emissions, as we have done in the past, uh, it will be used up in less than 20 years. So basically, uh, the chances of reaching that 2 degree limit, or staying below that 2 deg degree limit, will drop dramatically if we don't act very fast. And that's illustrated here in this slide. If we decided to reduce the global emissions now in 2010 and then reduce them linearly, that's this black line here, then we stay within this budget and have a good chance to stay below 2 degrees global warming. But if we wait for 5 years, uh, we'll have to reduce much faster, namely about 3.6% per year. Uh, and if we wait 10 years, we have to reduce by about 6% per year. And that becomes quite unfeasible. That is like one Kyoto Protocol implemented every year. Uh, economists say that 6% reduction per year is, is almost impossible. So emissions have to peak very, very soon if we want to have a chance to stay below that 2 degrees warming. And as you can see also, if we wait for too long before we reach this turning point, we have to go to negative emissions by 2050, and that's also quite unrealistic that this could be achieved. Although theoretically it's possible, I don't think I will live to see a planet with global negative CO2 emissions. 
Um, also, what you can see, if we had started in 1992, when at the Rio Earth Summit the Framework Convention on Climate Change was passed, if we had started to act actually then, when the global community decided it was actually necessary to do so, we could have reduced emissions at a very leisurely pace of less than half a percent a year to uh, still stay below those two degrees. So the window of opportunity is falling shut on us right now, and that's the urgency for the Copenhagen talks. Now the final slide I want to show is that we can actually solve this problem. There are, I could go through all the solutions in different sectors, transport, heating. I want to just concentrate on the electricity supply. Uh, there are detailed studies that show we can supply Europe 100% from renewable electricity at current electricity prices. What we need to do is use the best areas for the different kinds of renewables and connect them all together in a network. That's the critical infrastructure we need, the so-called European supergrid, um, because that allows us to tide over uh, lulls in wind speed, etc. Because if we have a large enough area that uh, the wind is blowing almost uh, at, at some place in Europe, it's blowing at any time, and we also have bioenergy, we have hydroenergy, we have uh, solar power. So in the north, at the coast, typically you would have wind turbines in the south, uh, like uh, this new power station in, in Sevilla here, not far from here, you can use thermal solar power stations and so on. Solutions are possible. Uh, they will not be implemented by government just uh, because of great insight in a top-down approach. I just came yesterday from a big con conference in Essen in Germany by cultural scientists on the great transformation that is required. And the, the social scientists are clearly telling us this kind of big transformation in a society uh, don't happen top-down from government. They need a lot of change agents that are within companies within the public sector, uh, everywhere in society at all levels basically, and I want to invite you, maybe you want to become one of those change agents working for the transformation of our society to a society based on a decarbonized economy based on renewable energy. Thank you very much, and if you want to read more, I have one book out in English, uh, another one in German, maybe there are some German speakers here. You can find details on my website. Thanks. Thanks very much for this very inspiring talk. And um, we are now taking questions. Please wait for the microphone. Sorry, you talked about the mechanism for heating. What is the mechanism for recooling, as must have happened after the Eocene and Pliocene, to bring the temperature back down once the, you know, the, uh, the CO2 has peaked? Uh, that's right. The long-term cooling trend that we have seen over the last 100 million years is due to a steady decline in the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere over that uh, very long time scale, which is due to the, the natural... CO2 cycle, which is related to the continental drift. Basically, the CO2 source is volcanic activity, and the sink is uh, the erosion of rock, which uh, then uh, binds the CO2 from the atmosphere and transports it into the ocean with the rivers, into the ocean sediment. So, over time scales of tens of millions of years, we have a very slow operating, uh, but very big carbon cycle, which uh, has caused big climate changes over the last hundreds of millions of years, including that, uh, including that very long-term cooling trend over the past hundred million years that got us into those ice ages starting about three million years ago. Both the, uh, you had a slide with the tipping point and 
the, you did not have any label for the gulp? Uh, I think I got your question. Um, you're talking about the Gulf Stream. I did have that it was called North Atlantic Deepwater Formation. That was a slightly more technical term for what is popular known as the risk of a Gulf Stream collapse that actually has been one of the main focuses of my research over the past 20 years. Um, this is one of those incalculable risks that unfortunately over the 20 years that I've been working on it, we haven't made much progress quantifying. The last IPCC report talks about an up to 10% risk of uh, abrupt shifts in ocean currents within this century um, and apart from making such a, a kind of a risk statement we, we can't quantify this any further. More questions? Um, 500 years ago we had a, a very big uh, societal change in Europe, which was the Reformation. Is, is that the order of magnitude that you think is needed for um, society now? Um, yes, I think we, we need a major societal transformation. We've had a, a, a boom time, so to speak, on the fossil fuels, obviously. Uh, which multiplied our ability uh, to, yeah, our material wealth certainly, our population was really magnified greatly by the boom in fossil energy that we had available. We, we simply were sitting on a, on a huge, cheap energy source there, we stuck upon that, but uh, now we see the limitations of using that and we very rapidly now have to advance our, not only our technology, but uh, it will be a deeper societal transformation as well, a transformation to sustainability because we on, not only have the climate problem, we also have the problem of the material resources that are also limited, the, the amount of matter that we use, uh, some rare substances like molybdenum or so, but also the, the very common substances, the nitrogen cycle, etc., has also grown exponentially and if big uh, emerging economies like China, India, Brazil, etc. were trying to emulate our lifestyle, then simply one planet wouldn't be enough. So we have to make a big transformation to a sustainable society that can feed a world population that will come up to about 9 billion during this century. And with the conventional way we have operated over the past hundred years, uh, it's certain that we cannot do that. Um, yes, uh, I'm very impressed by your presentation and very, very daunting actually, <laughs> the kind of things that you're describing. Um, I'm thinking about what individual consumers such as ourselves can do. Uh, for instance, yesterday the Australian government cancelled abruptly, three weeks early, the subsidies it was providing for people to put solar panels on their houses. Um, and it did that again, it did that, it's the same sort of thing 20 years ago when Australia lost the uh, leadership in solar panel research. Uh, so what can individuals, individual consumers do to persuade governments to be a bit more proactive in this sphere? Well, first of all, of course you can try and put pressure on your governments in various ways and uh, in Germany for example we see now that every new coal fire power station that is announced and planned draws big demonstrations people protest against it and uh, quite a number has been cancelled due to these protests so uh, of course you can vote uh, you can whatever ways you have to influence your uh, members of parliament and on the other side you can look at your own CO2 budget, of course, you are the master of your own emissions and I think uh, for most people it is very easy to reduce them by at least half within a few years if, if you just uh, concentrate on if you buy new appliances or a car or anything to get the most energy efficient uh, available in the market, that's already uh, a big step. Um, 
one big problem is international air travel, obviously. Uh, there we, I don't see a technical solution to that. There probably we just have to try and uh, travel less than uh, we do, which uh, the people here probably all travel quite a lot, but that's only a small proportion of the world population. Most of them will never see an airplane. Virtual travel, perhaps. Um, yeah, I actually last week I gave a, a talk in the United States, but I recorded it before at home and sent the DVD over and they ran on one screen my PowerPoint presentation and on the other screen the video of my presentation and that saved uh, probably about 10 tons of CO2 emissions or so. So that's, that's certainly one way for the future. And uh, if you have a choice of electricity supplier, I would uh, change to go to a, a decisive, decisively renewable energy supplier, that, at least in Germany, that's available. Okay, thank you. Let's thank um, Stefan again. Okay, now we know the motto is mastering our own CO2 emissions. And before we leave for the, uh, the coffee break, I have a couple of announcements. One of them is you, you don't want to miss the bus for uh, tonight's gala dinner. And uh, you've got in your conference bag a sheet which details where the buses will start from. And this is in front of the, uh, the hotel uh, Malaga Palacio. 8. Okay. At 8 p.m. Now there will be um, demonstrations. Um, during the lunch break at the exhibition area and I would like to mention them uh, explicitly at half past one it's a surgical teleconference with DVTS which you can follow there and uh, quarter to three it's CNET, the Common Network um, Information System which will be shown the post-exhibition post at the exhibition area I would like to draw your attention to that one and, um, and the, the, uh, the speakers will know the um, the ones responsible for the poses will be available during the afternoon coffee break today. Feedback. We need your feedback on, on the sessions and maybe it's a very good idea to do that right now when the memory is still fresh, so you can do that online and we welcome your feedback very much. There is one room change. Session 7G is moved to the plenary room, so to this one. And, uh, if you want to attend that one, then please note this change of room. So, coffee next. Thank you. <laughs>